to do a lot of research in Southeast Asia and to parapsychology in Malaysia in the 1960s. And one is entitled Cranbrook at 80, his contributions so far. Anthropologists, mammologists, zoo archaeologists, chartered biologists, and naturalists. Which is actually a title that's too short, as the article then talks about many more things that he has done. The remaining three articles in the special supplement are by his former students, or scientists who have followed his lead in fields of study that he pioneered. They range from his work on the Malaysian National Conservation Strategy, the flora, flora biodiversity, bamboo inhabiting semi aquatic bugs, feeding preferences of the left leaf doctor, cave crabs from Guru Mursili, filarial worms from the first century Sarawak archaeology, and little fossils, which was written by the edition, the Malaysian war tissue, Kiva Kimaroga Santu, the Malayan mountain sources, Southeast Asian primates, conservation of Sabah brain forest mammals, translocating primates and other animals, diverse, the diversity of bats at Udu Boma since its establishment of the study in 1965, blue tailed and blue throated bee eaters, white nest triplets, tree planting in cities to support Southeast Asian wildlife, the Arctic ornithology, and the herpetofauna of South and Southeast Asia. The esteem and affection with which it is held by students and spheres is obvious from reading all these articles. A species of Himalayan shoe has been named Propidura Gatonai to mark the Earl's contributions to the study of mammals in Southeast Asia. A new species of cave crabs is named Stigo Peltusa Cranbrooke after Gaton Gatonai, the Earl of Cranbrook, the renowned archaeologist and expert on cave swiftness. With the discovery of the crab species says, I therefore take great pleasure in naming this species after an old friend who has contributed so much to stabilization, biodiversity, and archaeology. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the house speaker for this afternoon, the right honorable the other camera. Good evening, most of Monday, 
getting married again on Wednesday. You better come and see me on Tuesday. <laughs> so I had my job interview on Tuesday in the Travelers Club. And as a modest young man, I was startled by the amount of feminine underwear that was scattered around his bachelor room. Uh, whether it was a last goodbye to wife number one or first greetings to wife number two, I, I really don't know. But at any rate, he did get married the following day. Um, I continued to take my degree uh, at Cambridge um, in natural sciences and model sciences, so I am both a, a naturalist and a philosopher. Uh, and uh, in due course, um, actually without waiting to go through the ceremonies of taking my degree, I bought myself a ticket for what I could afford, which was £108 on the Blue Funnel Line, and I sailed out of Liverpool in 1956. And those of you who have either historical knowledge or memory will remember that that was the year in which Mr. Nasser, or Colonel Nasser, um, nationalised the, the, uh, the canal, the Swiss Canal. And as we traipsed across the Mediterranean, the captain would periodically give us updates on the political situation and warn us that if anything went wrong, we would have to turn around and go back, back around South Africa, which would add another four weeks or so to our journey. But we did in fact go through the canal shortly before it was closed. Um, and I had with me Alfred Russell Wallace's uh, travels in the Malay Archipelago, which you may not know, the Malay Archipelago, I hope you do all know, the land of the bird of paradise, the orangutan and the bird of paradise. And he describes how he was molested by the Gully Gully men in Port Said, and so on. So I had exactly the same experience. And I, I say, oh, well, after 28 days, think of that. Who would tolerate 28 days to Singapore nowadays? Um, uh, I met my Mr. Harrison, who was having a Sunday tiffin lunch, which was the custom there. And he said, go to this dark, troubled old boy. And I said, no, sir, I've, I've not been troubled by this stuff. Um, and I sailed on to Sarawak, which was in those days, Singapore to Sarawak, it was three days at sea, two nights. And Tom Harrison knew the captain of the boat, he knew that I was interested in birds. And so the captain of the boat uh, politely sailed twice around an island called Bantala, which I have no idea really where it is, except it was halfway between Singapore and Borneo, covered its seabirds, all of which took flight. He blew the hooter on the, on the ship, uh, and I enjoyed the spectacular sight of seabirds flying. So I, I got to the Sorok Museum where uh, I, had, uh, I had told my mother it ought to be away for nine months. And in fact, I stayed away for about 40 years on and off. And so I arrived at Kuching ultimately after my long sea journey in the Rubble Brook um, and began to work at the Sorok Museum as what was called technical assistant to the creator. The uh, Sarawak Museum, so-called old building, uh, is there still. It has a, a magnificent display in it of Sarawak culture and Sarawak artifacts and other things. Uh, there's a lovely big crocodile there with the hairball that was covered from its stomach with a pair of false teeth in it as well. Um, and uh, the new building down below, which is called the Butterfly Building, has just been just been created. And that was where Tom Harrison moved his headquarters. But I spent a great deal of time traveling around the, around the country, collecting for the, the, um, the museum. Those days, there was no sun cream, so we wore long sleeve jackets and covered ourselves as much as we could, plated ourselves as much as we could against the sun. There was no plastic sheets, and so when we made a cap in the jungle, we used to carry what is called kaja. I don't know how many people of you no one is a Kajak in this room. Even the people who live in Kajak must be a Kajak. Um, but it was, a, it was a very neatly made structure of, of palm leaves, which was the, the kind of sheet that you carry with you. Um, uh, so Tom Harrison, I am deeply grateful to him for the experience he gave me. He encouraged me to collect at the time. Uh, he, the collection of birds in Sarawak had been funded by Dr. Lokwanto, and the Lokwanto Harrison bird collection was being built up. And so uh, Harrison had trained young men to go out back to their villages, and consignments of birds would come in in various states, mostly reasonably well prepared, and then I would have to identify them and sort them. 
uh, Bill Smithies, the forester, the, the forester who's, I might as well tell this, I asked Bill Smithies, I met him in England before, I also met Bertrand Brooke, incidentally, so I didn't meet one of the Ruby Brooks. Um, uh, I asked Bill Smithies, who was a very taciturn man, who didn't like speaking unless he really had to, and I said that again to Robert, what is the most important thing that I really should take with me? And he was silent for a while, and then he said, an umbrella. <laughs> so the night before I left, we had a party, and I'm afraid to say I scouted the Jones uh, cloakroom, and I chose the umbrella that I took with me. This Having left there one which I couldn't recognize myself, so somebody had my umbrella, and I had somebody else's umbrella, and it came with me to throw up. Um, yeah, so uh, Tom Harrison at that time uh, uh, had received a large grant of $25,000 from the group Benkian Trust in order to pursue his excavations at Nyeh Cave. This, uh, those of you who haven't been there, is the view from inside the west mouth of Nyeh Cave, which is absolutely enormous. In, in feet, it's 250 feet wide and 150 feet tall. Um, the excavation site is down there on the right. Um, and this is an aerial photograph that I took from a, a helicopter flight quite a long later of what it looks like from, from the outside. It's fairly inconspicuous from the outside, but it is the most enormous cave. And it was here that Tom Harrison was excavating. He started off in 57. His head started in 54. He uh, returned in 57 with Michael Tweedy from uh, the Raffles Museum as his uh, geological advisor. Uh, he also had Hugh Gibb and they made a film uh, about Swiftlets, uh, but uh, they made a two films about Borneo, and the Swiftlet film uh, with David Attenborough's over uh, commentary, one pound door at, at um, where is that? in France, but that's what it's In 57, he uh, asked me to sort out the Swiftlets. <laughs> At that time, there was great confusion about the birds that will be dead or nests. There were all sorts of theories in existence. The white nest, as those of you will all know, is the most valuable nest. Uh, but in these caves, you also found nests made of vegetable material, which were called mossy nests, and you also found these nests, which were called black nests, which were made out of the bird's saliva and feathers. I studied most intensively the black nests, but I did what other people had not done before. So, I was, uh, because I was living in this cave for weeks at a time, I, I, I caught birds on their nests. And so I was able to discover that, in fact, when you look closely at them, that the mossy nest bird is externally distinguishable from the white nest bird, and also both of them are distinguishable from the black nest bird. So I was able to recognize morphological characters, which uh, enabled, uh, uh, retrospectively, birds to be identified, and showed that the current theory, the current theory was that the bird would build a white nest until it got exhausted, and then it would go out and gather moss and things like that and build an alternative nest. Um, I was able to show that that was not true, that there were these sweet repeated separate species, each of which is physiologically designed to be able to compete a different kind of nest. These black nest birds uh, actually pluck feathers from their own body in, in the nest and stick it in. That's why the, 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 you see all the feathers that is stuck between laminae of saliva. And one of the studies I did was to try to see how the reproductive cycle tied in with the salivary cycle. They had to have the salivary glands underneath the tongue. They become enlarged when the bird is nest building. And uh, the bird secretes this uh, rootless salivary material, which is what makes the edible part of the bird's nest. Uh, these people, these these witches, uh, layer this with feathers. Uh, and what I discovered was, uh, by uh, taking uh, sections of the birds and, and, and examining their anatomy, I discovered that the uh, males could be sexually inactive 
but nonetheless, possibility. They could be sexually inactive or sexually active, that is, they could have big or small gonads, uh, and with enlarged, enlarged uh, salivary glands. So whatever was going on in their family relations, they were busy building nests. The females, on the other hand, uh, during the reproductive period, when they had to produce eggs, which is a very demanding, uh, demanding process, uh, they ceased to produce salivary, their salivary glands would reduce. So uh, females could have enlarged salivary glands when their reproductive tract was inactive, but when it was active, uh, their, saliva, their salivary glands were likely to be inactive. And so this was what got me my PhD when I went to England because I worked at the laboratory of Sir Solly Zuckerman, who was very interested indeed in reproductive cycles among animals and was very interested in the, the factors that control the, the, the reproductive cycle. So here was another cycle, the cycle of the salivary gland, which appeared to be dependent on different factors. The interesting thing is that these nests are harvested, and if you take away the nest, within a short time, uh, the bird begins, the salivary glands become active, and they will rebuild the nest within 40 days. And this is what is the basis of the commercial first nest industry, of course. So my first year in Sarawak, uh, I was uh, concentrated uh, on the study of the bird's nest in the UK, uh, while Michael Tweedy was the zoologist. Michael Tweedy uh, was uh, a, 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 a good biologist, um, and he kept the animal bone that he could identify from there. So the following year, um, Tom Harrison asked me to take charge of the management of all animal remains, whether they were snail shells um, or bones of frogs, birds, uh, or whatever. And so this became my job, and I altered the process, um, and I, I began a system whereby every piece of bone was kept uh, and identified. So I created what is now a huge problem in the Sarawak Museum, because there is an enormous collection of bones and bone material. But nonetheless, uh, I gave, a, I think, a much better uh, uh, database from which to analyze the, uh, the, both the occurrence of animals and also, more importantly, the way people dealt with animals. Uh, we discovered, from this, we discovered that, for instance, that pigs and monkeys were the most important. Uh, from the, the, in the very earliest age, pigs were the most important food. Uh, from about 40,000 years ago, monkeys began to become a very important food. So it's quite clear that these early people in the Akkei had the capacity to collect, somehow to kill uh, arboreal animals, such as monkeys, as well as building traps that captured pigs. So this is the kind of analysis one can do to build up a conjectural picture of the way of life of people and also, uh, as I was more interested in, in to building up a picture of what was the fauna of the time, what were the mammals of that period, um, and how they might differ from what we have nowadays in Borneo. After uh, I went to, I did my field work for my PhD in Birmingham, mostly in Sarawak, uh, and uh, then I uh, got a postdoc fellowship to Indonesia. <coughs> Uh, when I was counted as Ati Burung Valley, and uh, the, I think you'd say Pakar or Layan Layan, possibly in Basel Layu, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, I, again, I had some very interesting experiences to compare Indonesia in 1960 with Sarawak in 1959. It was a very interesting experience in Sarawak, I was one, and if we wanted to do something, I'd like to do like he could, was what people would say. Uh, but in, in Indonesia, I was dealing with people who treated me as an equal, and I was talking to students, and it was uh, altogether very refreshing. On occasion, they would say to me, I do hope you are not Dutch, because if you are Dutch, I get to stick a knife in your head. But I enjoyed my time in Indonesia, and I enjoyed all subsequent visits to Indonesia. And this is just to remind me of the months I spent living in Bogor, where the climate was very, was there very agreeable, it was 
now will become rather a big dusty town. And this is the memorial to Mrs. Raffles that has been restored and is in Morgan Botanic Gardens. Um, so Raffles also became a hero of mine, and I have done quite a lot to study Raffles' zoological collections. Uh, and I also learned the pleasures in, in, in Java of living on, in Morgan Bay, going out to Punjab for weekends and things like that, to a So when I was appointed to the University of Malaya, uh, where in 1961, um, I was given by the university a perfectly reasonable bungalow in town, but I am um, uh, I, I am an urban pokey, as it were. Uh, I need green space around me. And so, with the book of experience, I started going up and down the hills. I've been in Sarawak with no tigers, no, no uh, CTs, as they were called, communist terrorists. And the jungle was a very safe place. In Sarawak, uh, you, you could walk freely and happily uh, in the jungle unafraid. So I was not afraid of the jungle. Here, there had been the emergency. The emergency had only ended in 57. It wasn't really over in 60. There were still black areas. But I hunted up and down the Old Bargain Road, um, and I came across this place. Which is there have been before the wars, there have been two dams built in the Kumba River, and this was one of the early intakes for water supply for Kalapur, I suppose. And there was still the Mandal's house there, which was a, a, a reasonably built house, it was a pretty good wreck. It's, uh, and then this is one of the dams, yes, which is this is taken much later, but here is the remains of the other dam. Um, which uh, in, at that time it's been filled up with gravel now because of all that has gone on in making the highway uh, and the river has been filled up with small stones. But in those days there was a very really reasonable pool uh, underneath that dam in the, in the centre valley. And the house is now very derelict and it wasn't as bad as that when I found it. It was, it was I needed to remove it, but the, it still had the doors and the shutters there. It hadn't been vandalised to the extent that it has now. Uh, and so I was pretty well installed. I had a bit of a problem because I asked the public works department if I could uh, hire this house off them. And they said, sure, but unfortunately the land stands on the the forest department, so we can't give you permission. So I went to the forest department and said, could I uh, live on this little patch of land? And they said, sure, but there's a house on it belongs to the public works department, so we can't, <laughs> we can't give you permission. And so ultimately I got these two intractable processes Like letter that you could imagine. It said, Yes, uh, we have decided that the rent for your land shall be $24 a year. Please tell us how much land you would like. <laughs> Think of that. I could have said, From here to the Thai border. Okay? <laughs> In fact, I said, Please come and measure how much land I have cleared. And I cleared three acres, so I played uh, eight, eight, eight uh, rigs per hour uh, for my, my per acre. The Gorbat River was where I had my bath each morning before I drove down to university, thinking under my breath how much more nicer it was. The temperature actually was quite cool. It's consistently uh, about 22 there. Um, it's a torrent stream. Um, I was thinking how much healthier and nicer it was than all these poor people who had to have showers before they came to work. Next door neighbor down the road at Batudur Bas was the uh, Oregon Hospital. And I became good friends with Dr. Malcolm Bolton, who was the, the blind doctor. And I took this photograph on one of the trips when I went round with him. In those days, the Oregon came home to the interior, very absolutely inaccessible by road. And he used to drop in by air, and he would take out casualties. He'd bring in medicine, uh, mostly simple medicines, plasters and, and uh, aspirins and things like that. Uh, but he was always welcomed by a great crowd when he arrived. We flew very high. Some of these were, were very high. And I did notice um, that before we took off, always the engineer of two, there's the pilot and engineer, went down the back and fiddled with something in the back. And so in the end, I said to him, what is it that you do before? The rather bad. And he said, well, you know, these altitudes, we can't take off unless I short circuit the safety mechanisms. <laughs> <laughs> but we survived. <laughs> and the curious thing, I don't know whether you can helicopter flights, but in these low helicopters, you're flying over the jungle, and you fly, boom, 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 up a mountain. And if suddenly 
across the mountain, and they are in an open space at the top of and your stomach completely falls away. It's, it, it's an entirely optical effect on, on your own, on your own stomach. But uh, he became very a good friend, and he provided me with stuff for my own house and also for the fuel station, which I will tell you about a little bit later, because we needed our own to stuff because no one else could uh, put the bread up to do it there. The other great influence on my life at this time was an American called Elliot McClure. He was an adventurous fellow, and he was engaged by the Americans to set up a, a, a bird rigging scheme in Malaysia. They uh, misnetted and just then been invented, and misnetting birds was bringing in new information about the birds of Malaysia that was hitherto completely unknown. Because everything that we knew about the birds of Malaysia in those days had been because people would shot things. People would see something moving and they'd shoot it. Uh, and that was the way museums and ornithologists and everyone, everyone worked in those days. Then the misnet came along and you could catch birds in greater number uh, and let them go alive with ring on them. And so we began to do all sorts of biological studies. But he also had the energy to build this astonishing tree tower. This tree was 143 meters tall, enormous great uh, jungle giant, big different car. And at the, at the top, he had, where the branches came out, he built a platform. This is merely the intermediate platform. So the ladder went up the side of the tree, and he rested for a moment on the intermediate platform, and he went all the way up to the top. Uh, and then you have to do a slightly gymnastic turn uh, to get around and to get on his platform. And he used to go up there every uh, Sunday, every Sunday if he could, or every other Sunday. Uh, then he was posted in 1963. And so I had been up with him before that, and I then continued his observations until through to 69. And at that time, that was the longest continuous series of observations from the tree platform. He was more interested in the behavior of the birds and animals that you could see from the tree platform. This is the view as it was, and there is the, the slope of a cross, looking across the Virgin Jungle Reserve of Compartment 23, I think, in the Gombat Forest. And you see all the silvery leaves. I'm afraid to say my photographs, of course, in those days were just black and white. You see the silvery leaves um, of uh, Shoria Curtisii, which is the ridge top mountain. It was the most marvelous view, but this is the view from, from this platform. Uh, this is one of my rather murky photographs from this platform of a, of a Siama plane in a nearby tree. Uh, so, uh, I, as I say, I continued his observations and I began to concentrate on the flowering and fruiting of these trees. And this is the plot from 1963, when I took over to 1969, of the flowering in blue, the, the fruiting in red, and the ripe fruit in green of some 62 tree canopies that could be seen from this platform. Now, as I say, my PhD had been on the factors that affect breeding in wild populations, and it was of particular interest for people at that time to study breeding cycles in parts of the world where climatic influence was least, where there's a little change in day length, where there is little annual change in temperature, and this was the ideal experimental situation. And therefore, it was fairly new to demonstrate that there is, in fact, a cycle. You can see that the blue cycle of flowering precedes the red cycle of fruiting. Um, and so that from, in the early part of the year, from February through to July, is a majority period of flowering. Uh, from May through to November or December is a majority of fruiting. And then the ripening fruit, which is the most important thing from the point of view of biological value, is uh, from September, October, November. So, roughly speaking, the, uh, although it's only three degrees north and it's only 12 minutes longer, the, the longest day than the shortest day here, then nonetheless it is the kind of cycle that parallels the cycle in the, in the, in the north, north temperate zone. And this is very interesting. Some of the trees were extremely regular in their, in their behavior. This is Pura Pelotaros Tapos, uh, and the top line there is new leaves and uh, new shoots every year. And if you go up the Gomba Valley now, in January or February, you will see Pelotaros. Um, it drops all its leaves, and then new leaves 
pieces of are bright red, and so you could pick out these candies, and it's still something which uh, I think is, is, is quite interesting to do each year to see if the cycle is continuing. So, in my own, again, speaking my own background, uh, in UK, in those days, if you wanted to take biology subjects in high school certificate, you had to attend a course running by the Field Studies Council, so you had to do field studies. My university degree that involved field studies during the summer vacations. Um, I was convinced that field studies ought to be included in the curriculum of biology students at the University of Milan. Uh, my thoughts were not wholly in accord with the with the scientific faculty, and in fact, I was at one meeting accused of uh, near colonialism and trying to impose alien cultural ideas on Malaysians who were not interested in the jungle because it was just a nasty place between comfortable towns where you could live safely. Uh, I'm very glad to say that in retrospect, I was very, very right when you look at the way that the Malayan Nature Society has grown in strength and in vigor and has become not only uh, somewhere where people are really enjoying the natural environment, but has become also an influence uh, on government for uh, restraining some of the more uh, disturbing attacks on the environment. So immediately above my house, which is just outside the picture, there was another natural clearing in the forest. Uh, the first field of course I, I gave was in 1962. At that time, when there was of course no highway as the old road, at about the 22nd mile, there was a, um, what was it called? Anyway, there, there, was a, uh, there was a house for, um, uh, I've forgotten. Uh, anyway, there was a guy who was there looking after this house, which could be used by people who wanted to experience uh, the, out, the, the, the life out of time. And so we used that. But then in 63, we had a camp in this clearing. Uh, we built ourselves some plastic shelters with plastic and then by then being invented. Um, and you could <coughs> safely roof yourself with plastic sheet, which you could buy quite cheaply. Uh, and we had students from Singapore who came up and shared the field station with us. I then I had a, a leave in the UK and I approached the Nuffield Foundation, uh, which was running a very large and successful field studies centre in Uganda on the shores of Lake Edward. And they were persuaded that they could give something, and they gave the equivalent of 90,000 ringgit. And with, uh, well, this is my, yeah, some of my students uh, and myself uh, in, in 63. Um, so uh, with that, that sum of money, because the university didn't have the funds or the inclination to do it, we were able to, to uh, the university did, university engineers did uh, design the structure. And so there's a hostel, there's a laboratory, there's a series of bathrooms, and there's staff quarters, which all sort of which fitted in to that chair. We surveyed all the trees, and we made the decision that we would resist all the attempts which is what the builders wanted to do, to bring the bulldozers in to make flat ground before we started. And so what we ended up was uh, a, a fairly simple, this is the hostel with a kitchen, uh, two dormitories, one male, one female, crowded out with 16 bunks in each. Uh, and then from the other side, uh, we retained the natural slope of the ground. So these, to be horizontal floor, they, these buildings were standing on long legs. Now this is something that was perfectly useful in Sarawak. Every house in Sarawak stands on dead legs, and the long houses themselves. Uh, so so to, to me, it seemed a natural thing to do. Uh, so that's what we did. We mapped the, all the existing trees, and we cut down nothing. We began to take uh, environmental measurements. Uh, this is the plot again from 63 to 69 of a number of rainy days, and again this is a familiar pattern to you with, a, with an early rain and the ma major rain during what we now know as the fruiting period. Uh, this was a little exercise I did with students walking through the forest with our bird nets set, uh, blue being the birds that we saw, red being the birds that we heard, and green being the birds that we caught in the nets. We didn't open the nets till 7 o'clock, so that uh, obviously the, the netting catch is skewed against that. But again, 
gives so it was a nice little field exercise which can be repeated by anyone to do field studies of it, which shows you the dynamical cycle of activity of birds. In 1967, uh, I got a grant from the Natural History Museum London. They were then interested in collecting skeletons. They wanted skeletons of birds and small mammals. They had plenty of skins. They wanted to know what the skeletons were. And uh, this again, rather surprisingly, I, I think I asked for 1,100 pounds, and the director of the museum was the only time it was ever happened to me. He said, I don't think that's enough I get to give you a bigger grant that you've asked for. Uh, that doesn't happen nowadays, but he gave me 1,500 pounds. Uh, two herpetologists came out, this is one of them, um, and they collected snakes, but the rest of us, we were collecting, these are two of my students, uh, we were collecting uh, birds and mammals and we were skeletonizing them, and this was sent back to the Natural History Museum. You may say that it's wrong to send things out to Malaysia, but this was funded entirely by the Natural History Museum, um, uh, and that's the way things were. Uh, on the top of Uno Bello, Despite the attractions available in Malaysia, I didn't decide that there was any one woman in the world who would suit me, and so I flew home. Um, and we were married in the 5th of May 1967. This is a long time later, but this is the, the lovely woman I am still married to. Um, and we are about to celebrate our golden wedding next year. Uh, so I flew home and married her, and then our first son was born. Uh, well, no, on the left is the thigh bone of the, uh, the 
extinct pangolin, and on the right is the thigh bone of the present pangolin, and over on the left is the same foot bone of the two animals. And so you can see that it was very considerably larger than the modern, the modern pangolin. Why it went extinct is hard to tell, uh, but it was possibly ecologically, I, I mean, it was obviously eaten by people because its remains are in the cave. But there's not many, and all the bones that are in the cave are attributable to a single animal. So they were not very often eaten. And so one assumes that sometime between, this is pretty old, this is about 40,000 years ago, uh, if, uh, if the, sometime between then and now, it became extinct, perhaps through habitat change, perhaps it was like the big African anteaters, it was adapted to a much drier climate that prevailed during the period when the land was exposed, um, and perhaps that's what it needed in order to survive. But at any rate, it went extinct, uh, and we have no clear explanation why. We also found uh, considerable remains of tapir. Tapir had been quite frequently captured by the people of Nia. Tapir, for those of you who don't know, is now no longer in, in, in Borneo. It doesn't exist in Sarawak or Sabah. And in fact, the first tapir bone was quite a mystery to me. It was identified by the famous Dutch paleontologist von Königswald as an elephant toe bone. But when I took it back to London to check this, it clearly wasn't an elephant. And so I, I, I found that it was, it was tapir. So uh, there's two things about the tapir remains. Most of them are for young animals. This is the canine of a very young tapir, which hasn't, has only just begun to cut through the, through the gum. It's got no root, as you can see. It's a very baby, baby tapir. And this is from Gua Sire. It's a surface find, so it's fairly recent. And in fact, we have good evidence that the tapir survived probably into the last century in, in Sarawak, before it got exterminated. And here are some foot bones. There on the left is the skeleton of the tapir. There on the right, uh, although they may look a bit furry to you, but they are identifiable as individual bones of the foot of the tapir. So we have no doubt also that there were, were tapirs there, and maybe the why tapirs went extinct is what we can, one of the things we can talk about in the discussion here. Similarly, in the Java rhinoceros, um, there is a, 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 an elbow bone from mud eye caves, which I have prepared and I have satisfied myself that it, um, that it is this rhinoceros, not the smaller rhinoceros. And then we have this foot bone. Um, this is fairly superficial. Again, I can mean, see it in, in the top foot. And therefore, this also may have survived until, well, maybe even until the, the uh, 18th or early 19th century. Uh, and certainly not more than 4,000 years ago. Uh, just to show you the sort of comparisons that we do, there are the various toe bones, the hind toe bone and the fore toe bone of the, of the Java rhinoceros on the left, and then the Sumatran rhinoceros on the right. And it's like uh, doing a crossword puzzle. You have to match up what you've got with what the origins are. The most surprising thing is the, the uh, tiger. Here are the most convincing tiger bones. There are the second the bone in the middle of the, the second bone in the middle of the forefoot of the tiger. Um, and there is our fossil in the middle. Uh, we have compared it with all sorts of other bones, uh, but that match seems to be more or less completely perfect. So we have evidence that there was the tiger also for yeah. But why the tiger became extinct is something which is quite mysterious. So now I will just move on to some of the things that I did after I left Malaysia. And one of the things I have done for the last, well, since 1978, is uh, uh, organize a voluntary museum in Suffolk, uh, which is the, uh, an engineering museum, which is interesting because it's on the site, the old work site, where, there is, uh, where these machines, these steam machines, and their uh, associated machines were made. Uh, thank you. The firm went bust a long time ago, um, and uh, we thought we had to, uh, to, in order to preserve the buildings, we formed, we formed a museum. 
Now this museum is called Gallat, and they, during the 19th and 20th century, they were major exporters of steam engines, portables they were called, because, not because they could be carried, but because you could pull them along and put them into place. And so it was very interesting to me to go to Taipei Museum <laughs> and see that the Gallat engine has been preserved there. So we knew that they had exported to Malaysia because we have the records. But here is the Gallup Museum from my museum, Gallup engine from my uh, works in Suffolk, which is now standing outside the, the Taiping Museum. And I don't know whether they realize what a very precious object they've got. <laughs> uh, I'll now come up to more recent things where Lim Achen was uh, connected with. Bukit uh, Kakun, where this young fellow and his cousin showed me teeth that they were finding not in the soil but in the rock formation of this extraordinary cave. Um, they were eager to do something, they were eager to knock them out and I didn't persuade them that we should uh, not uh, do anything about this until it could get properly organized as a research project. So we're very glad indeed. Yeah, yes, yeah, Professor Ross. Um, that in the end, she took charge of the research project. We had a student from uh, Iraq who came out. Uh, it needed, I tried knocking some of these birds, but the uh, permission to be given from the rock. Um, and I was clumsy and so on. But this lady was very assiduous indeed, and she got all sorts of interesting things out. Most of the teeth, teeth of rhinoceros, uh, uh, pigs. Most of these, it's so the same as we've got there, but yeah, I know she got rhino. What? Well, then, that was the excitement. She got out some big primate teeth, and we got overexcited about these because they looked very primitive, and I thought, wow, we found a man in Malaysia. But, uh, so, uh, I don't know who prevented it, but they were not allowed to take them out of Malaysia, and so they took them to the dentist. The dentist wrecked one, so there were six specimens left. There's six casts, and we got a grant to bring uh, a and at Yasemin to London, and we sat around the table with all the grey beards wagging, swallowing all the beards again, and looking at all the people from different ages of, of mankind, and then, and then they decided it was a right time. So while we have proven by zooarchaeology that there were tapir, tiger, and java rhinoceros in Borneo, we've also, through this particular exercise, shows that there was a right tank peninsula Malaysia in Perak as long as 300,000, well, 500,000 years ago, and in Batu Caves about 30,000 years ago. 30 to 60,000 years ago. The audience is thankfully left correcting me because <laughs> So uh, that is really exciting stuff. And so there's another big question, is what did you Peninsula Malaysians do to exterminate the right in, in the last uh, 30,000 old years? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has a memory quite as long as that. So these are just a few of the faces I remember. This is Dr. Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> this is the late Bacala, who was a marvelous support to me uh, in some of the past studies I did. I've only got that picture of his rear end, I'm afraid. Uncle Ben, then saw the top left, Sipan, top right, Kami Chow, bottom right, and I'm afraid Sam got one. Yeah, I'm just helping us there. So, let's go. Uh,